So we've been sitting for a little bit, so I'm gonna turn this just for like 10 seconds to make you actually stand. But we just had a great session on metrics. So everyone, if you can all stand up for just a quick 10, like 10 seconds max. Stretch your arms, you know, this is sustainability. It's all about getting some like life back into you. Fabulous, amazing. Okay, so sit down only if you like clicks. Right, if you're an agency person or a marketer, sit down if you present clicks. <laughs> sorry guys, sorry. <laughs> okay, if you're a marketing person and you think clicks are important, even though we just found out that it's potentially a, not a very good, I'll, I'll refrain from swearing for about 10 seconds only. <laughs> so if you, if you think it's a great metric or you know one that you really want your agencies to report back to you on, sit down. So everybody here virtually hates clicks, right? I'm gonna call half of you out <laughs> because you're all full of it. <laughs> so you can all sit down. <laughs> but I've seen a lot of conversation and I get asked all the time, but we've got sustainability in there. There's this other thing that we've got to learn. Number one, that's really hard. Number two, is it gonna affect my clicks? So. Uh, I've got the amazing Courtney here today. We've got a little bit of a story that we're going to take you down, a little bit of a journey. Um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background first and then we're going to tag team through some of the results. Um, so our entire session is beyond clicks. So I'm glad that nobody likes them, even though we potentially have to sell them or tell how, how great it is. So um, University of Tasmania came on a journey um, and with Pivotus, their agency, they put a lot of trust in what they were doing. So to rewind a little bit and understand why, they're very sustainability focused and Courtney will go into that in a lot more detail. Um, but why are we here? Why does Scope 3 exist? Why has the IAB um, at net zero, the world, um, sorry, the AANA um, and the MFA all come together and went, okay, we actually need to care about this. So worldwide, just a little bit of fun fact, a little bit of doom and gloom, but we need to reduce our emissions by two thirds um, over the next decade. It's actually a lot shorter than that. We've got six Christmases. 2030 is the date that you've seen a lot of numbers being focused towards. So we all have to do something. Um, and to Gay's point earlier, you all have keep cups at home and I'd like to see how many people actually use them today. And I know that's a really silly small one, but it's one that people cared about pre-COVID, but nobody uses now. <laughs> hey, thank you. <laughs> um, if we sit there and actually just look at our digital footprint, um, spoiler alert, there's a lot more that you all can actually do in this room that will have more of an impact than anything that you can do personally. So if we just take a look at TikTok, you know, we're talking about social and metrics, but you know, an average Australian spends about two hours on TikTok every day. Um, that's 2.6 grams per minute. If you sit there and take a look at an hour of video, that's about 55 grams. And if we sit there and take a look at a thousand impressions, that's anywhere between 50 to 1500 grams of carbon. Now, a thousand impressions is nothing. You've done like a test with probably about a million impressions, not even looking at a thousand impressions. So for you to actually start to understand what this means, it's huge. Um, just to sort of give you a little bit of context, if you went vegetarian for an entire year, you'd only be saving 700 kilograms of carbon. So if you sit here and do some of that math real quick, you're not really talking about a, even a campaign. You're probably taking a look at one day's worth of carbon. So, um, you know, how big is this problem across our industry? If we sit here and take a look at like the internet, our gadgets, you know, all the systems that support us, it basically is the same as the aviation industry. And everyone thinks the aviation is bad, but have we ever looked at our own industry and recognized how bad it is? Um, and this actually is one of my favorite say sayings that actually came from one of our co-founders. So data centers are the factories of the 21st century. You just can't see the smoke. Um, Hopefully all of you guys are aware, but I now call it out because I have been asked before. Everything that we use, including the laptops that were on the internet, works off a server. Servers are physical things. It is not the cloud. 
It doesn't bounce off space. It is a physical box <laughs> that actually calls things and uses electricity and air conditioning to keep it down. I know that sounds ridiculous, but I do need to actually call this out, just in case for those that don't know. So, but that's all really nice and well. This is the big world. What does that actually mean for my agency? If we sit down and take a look at an agency's footprint, your scope one, which is your own, your agency's own emissions, is only about 0.05%. The purchase emissions, your office heating, the electricity, everything that you, know, you work with from a direct partner is about 1.2%. That's considered your scope two. When you look at your scope three emissions, it actually sits at about 98.3%. So everything you do on a day-to-day -day basis from a marketing point of view, from an agency point of view, even from a tech world, there's um, a significant element that actually really sits in your scope three that most people aren't aware of. So just to bring this a little bit home, we are at Measure Up, we are really sort of talking about a lot of our digital world and uh, focusing it a little bit into our programmatic traditionally is when, what people think when you think digitally. So if we just look at programmatic, it alone generates 3.8 million metric tons. So that's globally. Um, and that's about 17.2 billion kilometers in a car. You know, like means nothing. Like I don't know if you know how many kilometers you drove, like took for you to get from home, but it's probably gonna be somewhere along the 10 to 20 kilometer mark. Um, I decided to go for a really stupid stat, but in case anyone wants to go from Sydney to the moon, um, you can go there 46,000 times, 46 to 47,000. We were arguing this in my marketing department, so I was not allowed to quote the exact figure. <laughs> so um, that's a lot. And that's just our programmatic industry. That's not taking into consideration any of the other elements or any of the marketing mix pieces or all the other channels that we've been talking about. So bring it back home, 1,000 impressions, charging your phone, more than like a month's work just with a thousand impressions. So obviously there's a huge problem. Hopefully that, that's clear. <laughs> and we've got to do some things to fix it. So carbon is a huge flashlight for inefficiency and waste. We've heard a lot, I was just saying to Courtney very, very quietly, we couldn't have gone after a better panel. Um, we obviously had Justin and Will sit there and talk about there's no more money, which is great and fine. And we need to actually do something more about it. <laughs> Summarizing, sorry guys. Um, but there is something that you can do that doesn't actually cost you more. It's just actually taking a look at inefficiencies, something that we all want to care about and not necessarily focus on those inefficient standard metrics that we've been looking at for a long time. So we've got a million metric tons of CO2 emitted just by non-viewable impressions. So people that can't even see these beautiful dollars that come out of your businesses. Um, and 15.3% sits on that made for advertising inventory. So we all know it made for advertising. It's actually probably gonna be a much bigger problem, especially with AI. Um, you know, there are AI driven sites that are being created virtually weekly now. And so there is a significant problem that we really need to actually understand to make the most out of our real marketing dollars. So why and when should it become a focus? Well. It kind of works in your favour. You can eliminate waste from your advertising, which means you're actually going to be spending your dollars where they should be. Um, you're improving your marketing outcomes. So you've got all these beautiful graphs and all these beautiful systems, but you can actually do better just by actually getting rid of a lot of that rubbish um, that unfortunately <coughs> exists across our industry. And then um, upside, and I guess a bit of the boring one, but it's important, <laughs> there is regulatory rep um, rep uh, reporting that is coming through. So. As of January next year, the government has said businesses are that sort of top tier and it sort of goes on through there. Um, but over 500 million, over 500 people are going to have to start reporting their CO2 emissions. So this is something that is coming, whether we like it or not. But thankfully, you're gonna love it because it's just gonna make your lives a hell of a lot easier, hopefully. So, you test. <laughs> University of Tasmania, sorry. Thanks, Jo. <laughs> now, don't be scared. I'm not going to click shame you today. I've been in marketing for a very long time, and I know that we've all been responsible for a bit of spray and pray here and there. But I think what I wanted to really touch on today is just the ethos of our organisation and why it was so easy for us to jump on board with this particular innovation. 
So before we begin today, I did want to take the opportunity to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Gadigal people, and pay my respects to Elders past and present. As a proud Aboriginal woman with strong cultural connections to Gubby Gubby country, it's always really important for me to acknowledge whose country I'm visiting, but also those who have come before us. And as Joe and I share our vision for a sustainable future, it would be remiss of me if I didn't acknowledge those who have come before us. After all, they were the first scientists, first environmentalists and first conservation activists. So it's really important for me to ground myself in that particular introduction today. So a little bit about the university. So I've been with UTAS for, on oh, here I said it. Yeah. <laughs> I've been with the university now for about two and a half years. I have been in the sector for a lot longer though. So about 15 years I've spent my life in a number of different marketing roles in education. The reason that I love it is because I can hand on heart honestly promote this wonderful product. I've seen firsthand the profound impact that it has on not only the lives of the student, the individual themselves, but their friends, their family, their community. So it's something that's pretty special to be a part of. And then two and a half years ago, in enters Tasmania as part of the picture. Now, can I just get a show of hands how many people have actually been to Tassie before? Okay, amazing. So you're gonna know what I'm talking about when I start to describe it. For those of you who haven't, I feel like I'm gonna do a bit of a disservice, but it is honestly one of the most breathtaking and beautiful places you can possibly visit. I love our colleagues at Tourism Taz. There aren't very many tourism bodies who would be able to market air, but we have done it. So <laughs> come down for air is the slogan, and it could not be more true. Honestly, it's beautiful. Pristine beaches, beautiful mountains, amazing hiking trails. So I jumped at the opportunity to be able to be part of a university that partnered the thing that I love, which is education, with this beautiful place. And in the two and a half years, I've had the opportunity to network with students who have taken butterfly samples on the top of Mount Kunyani or Mount Wellington. I've been able to interview students who have done scuba diving to look for kelp on our east coast. And there's a couple of clever cookies who are doing their PhD in climate action and what that looks like and taken a couple of trips to Antarctica. So we live and breathe it and natural resources are obviously a huge part of what we do and critical in terms of building this brand around sustainability. We've won a bunch of awards for it, swag of awards, I'm not gonna talk about it too much, but it is through innovation and constant trial and constant application of these new technologies that we're able to have that title of the number one in climate action for three years running. And it's not a title that we take lightly and it does involve taking some risks but I realise that sounds like a bit of a marketing spiel. Um, so I did also want to share some data which underpins why we do what we do as well. So this is a bit of a stark um, comparison, I suppose, for us in terms of the living um, circumstances for some of the population in Tasmania. So when we think about sustainability, it's not just about preserving our natural resources, it's also about creating betterment for our communities. So when we look at Hobart, which is our central city, if you go 20 k's outside of Hobart, the average life expectancy is about 20 years less. So every kilometre you get outside of the city, it's one year less. So that is a really drastic difference in terms of those living um, environments for these particular populations. This is quite similar in a lot of our regional and metropolitan areas, and it's something at the university that we believe um, Stu students, prospective students, communities, they should have access um, to the best possible healthcare, the best possible education and the best possible opportunities. And this is where embedding those sustainable practices is really critical for us. If you want to take it Australia wide, this also links to as well to the um, education inequalities that exist around further education as well. So this is Australia wide and you'll see there the disparity between a male who has a university qualification as opposed to those that one that doesn't have one is about 10 years difference. So it's pretty significant and for women this trend is also similar as well. Not quite, um, not quite as significant but also you know something to be noted. And this is where we as the University of Tasmania have that deep commitment to our communities to ensure that education is accessible to all. We've also got our own challenges on island. So we've got about 55% of our students who complete year 12, 35% go on to get an ATAR. ATAR isn't everything, but it certainly helps in terms of positioning them successfully uh, for their university studies as well. The Australian Universities Accord came out pretty recently and we do have some really ambitious targets around improving the educational attainment for our students as well. 
So in the next couple of decades, we've got to get that number from 55% to 90%. So it's through initiatives like this um, and having the challenging conversations with, uh, you know, like our agency, so Pivotus, being really upfront and honest about, you know, we need to also focus on how we're going to get those quality conversions, but also live and breathe the values of our brand. So these are just some of the priorities that we have and being a leader in sustainability is one of those really key commitments that we have and a point of differentiation for us as a university as well. So that's just a bit about the university and our commitment. Cheers, Courtney. So, I mean, it was great because obviously Courtney's already sustainability focused, University of Tasmania, you know, has sustainability written in their title, you see them, they've won awards. But Pivotus still had to come to them with a whole bunch of information. They interrogated the scope-free methodology. They had a whole bunch of different questions that sort of came to us. They can't present vanity metrics to an organisation that is so focused on accuracy and education. So if we sat there and we came to them and said, hey, look, we think we can do better. Um, and they, you know, we've got a whole range of case studies and that's great. But when we sit here and we actually have to take a look at everything from a personal point of view. So let's actually just take a look at a campaign. Um, and for context, I will also say kudos to Courtney because they actually came on board as a partner before they tested anything out. So they went, look, no, this is written into what we're doing. We really believe in this. We've seen what you've done. We've checked your methodology. She had the academics go through it themselves as well. Um, and they went, look, no, we're committing to this for 12 months up front without a question. And the results hopefully were Surprising? <laughs> so, in a good way. <laughs> in a good way. Um, so this is just taking a look at the campaign that was done fairly recently. These are all new results. No one's actually ever seen any of this before. But it was taking a look at March to April, May. And so you can take a look at the pre-optimization period. So we took a month's worth of data and they went, let's take a look at this. And we're just going to take a look at if we enable scope theory to start understanding emissions alongside all our other metrics what can we actually move, optimise and actually sort of move around? And it doesn't take the agency very long at all. Um, unfortunately, Dane, who does all the bits and pieces, isn't here, but I think he testimony that took him no longer than 10 minutes. I can ask Michael later. Um, but you can see that the... So um, for those of you that have never seen this before, uh, new acronym, hopefully. So GCO2PM. So G is grams. CO2, carbon dioxide, if you remember back to science class a couple of years ago. Um, and then PM per thousand. So, you know, somewhat familiar, but hopefully you remember grams of carbon dioxide per thousand. So we take a look at everything and everything's measured in grams, kilos, tons, etc. cetera. Um, but we bring it down to an average so that we can work on a standard metric across everything, understanding it at a channel basis or an individual basis. So post the optimization, 76% drop in a month. Again, understanding what can be done in how, and how quickly it can be done. There was a big conversation. Courtney, Pivotus came to you and they said, we're going to get rid of a metric, which we now understand is a bullshit metric. But <laughs> I love that you swore first. <laughs> <laughs> um, how did you feel when they said, yeah, I your think clicks might drop? And I think um, the benefit that we had was the equity in our relationship with the agency. I'm not going to lie, we've obviously worked with Pivotus for a long time. so. I think one of the added advantages we had is we had trialled a number of different initiatives, not just with Scope 3, but in, in terms of really finding those quality audiences that we were looking at as opposed to quantity. And for us, that's particularly important because the life cycle of our student in terms of their consideration sets takes 18 to 24 months on average. So you're talking about a really, really extended process. And that attribution model for us is quite a challenging one. But we had come off the back of a really successful campaign uh, where we'd seen an increase in our applications of about 35%. So when I went to Pivotus and said, look, the numbers are numbering, the math is mathing. How do we overlay sustainability as part of this? To, in, to ensure that we're actually getting those really quality conversions, but at the same time doing our bit for the organisation and really delivering on the values of sustainability. Um, so when they came to us with this proposal, uh, the risk just wasn't even a risk for us. Um, we w did know that you know, we might run the risk of not getting um, the number of views, but I think when you talk to your C-suite, that's a conversation that can easily be kind of mitigated with the fact that, you know, if conversions are increased, which I think you'll find uh, was a really lovely and amazing outcome for us to receive, uh, that far offsets. 
any number of views that you're going to get or you know any conversations around the fact that you haven't had the amount of eyeballs that are needed for those conversions. So I mean it's great that Pivotus had already had some of these conversations but I think there was three people that sat down when I had asked that question originally. <laughs> You all don't believe in clicks anyway. So why are we still really sort of focusing it as an industry? And I mean, look, there are some times that clicks go up when you are using Scope 3, just as a heads up. Um, but I think we need to really understand what it actually means. And so for University of Tasmania, their conversions increase by 264%, um, which is amazing. But the upside is they were also able to get a total, um, if you look at their emissions, their total emissions actually went down by 30% which is huge. So for someone so leaned in. Yeah, look, it didn't, um, other than this, we, I didn't need any further justification to the executive. But I think the other really strong value that it brought to the table is that we were actually doing something with tangible and meaningful benefits. So it not only aligned, and our vice chancellor is very passionate, has written thesis is about the point of change and what we need to do as a society, but to see it in real numbers and to have, i uh, blessed with a number of academics who like to interrogate the data and interrogate the methodology, but to know that this was all above board and something that we could just implement and not have to think about because the methodology is already done, it was something that just came to fruition for us in a way that we had never anticipated these numbers. So from an implementation point of view, just so you're aware, all that is basically, all that was done for this campaign as a really small test was moving away from high climate risk inventory. So what that is, is basically, um, I guess it is a bit of a plug, but scope3.com has a free tool that you can literally type in any website. You can understand the average GCO2 PM, that average grams of carbon per thousand, and actually go, well look, if it's red, it's probably gonna be bad. Um, one of the other things is a lot of the climate risk inventory is made for advertising. So it's actually understanding how you can do this in more of an automated fashion so that it isn't like a manual sort of an uh, block list, but there are tools that allow you to buy greener media without really sort of focusing on this. And because I think it's good to sort of see some of the bigger numbers, just to sort of give you a real insight, when you actually take a look at the climate risk, it wasn't the majority of the impressions. Like overall, what we're trying to do for the publishers and so forth in the room. We're trying to get more money to you, the actual real content providers that have real staff behind everything that you're doing. <coughs> so it was only about 200,000 impressions that were served across climate risk inventory in this one small example. Um, but if you actually take a look at the emissions, it was over 166 grams. So it's a considerable amount um, when, when you actually sort of start to understand. And so to be able to get a 30% drop, and this, this is just a proportion of the entire campaign, but to understand that you can actually get those significant drops fairly easily just by avoiding sites that aren't actually generating you any real results anyway, I think just sort of makes it easy to put forward. Um, I guess just to sort of highlight something as well, just so you are aware, two, of the third, two thirds of the top 500 fortune companies have said that they have significant climate commitment. So they're all looking at reducing their emissions. This is a topic that you can't get away from. You've probably seen it absolutely everywhere. And from a marketer's decision, you're not alone. 75% of marketers said they will look to actually start to measure and reduce their emissions. So this sort of gives you sort of some of that timeline in terms of some of them that are doing it and some still have no plans to start. But I guess if you take away nothing from today, if you can start measuring and reducing, not only will you be doing good for your own companies and your own brand, but you're actually also gonna be doing something for the planet, which I know sounds crazy and a little bit hard to take in and understand sometimes, but you will actually have a significant, um, uh, something significant to say in terms of saving emissions and saving the planet. And I think this sort of goes in hand with some of the things that, um, you, uh, sorry, Courtney will talk about in a second just in terms of what it means for University of Tasmania. But customers and employees do care. I think, you know, you can't really sort of hide under a rock anymore. We realise that sustainability is a big focus for everybody and people are wanting to do better. Some people are really unaware of what they can do. But by you doing this and by you putting a stand, you'll actually generally um, get more of an audience and you'll actually have appreciation from your customers and your employees, which helps from retention and hopefully gaining more. Um, just quickly to sort of give you an insight. so. This isn't just numbers that are pulled from a sky in one company who's actually sitting here and measuring. 
There's the Global Media Sustainability Framework that got released in Cannes in June. So this um, basically is a framework that had all of the agency groups to come together, the World Federation of Advertising, um, and a whole bunch of other partners, including us, including Scope 3, basically came into a room, and I know it sounds crazy, but they agreed within a year of framework to actually start measuring and understanding emissions. Um, it's basically going to be a five-step process, really focusing on the metric and methodology, and have focused and started on the top five channel, uh, six channels for now. Cinema is at 0.5, so this is the reason why it's like five and a half channels for, for where we're at at the moment. Um, you can't be Global Media Sustainability Framework accredited or Ad Net Zero IAB like, accredited for this as yet. Um, but there is formulas that are coming out to allow you to actually understand what this means from a measurement point of view and actually um, start to, I guess, put your, put all your ducks in a row to actually understand what steps you should be taking as an individual organisation and company. So just to sort of go back to University of Tasmania, I think it's a good sort of time to sort of highlight why, I guess, you guys came onto the journey and what it means for you. Yeah, so I think the numbers really do speak for themselves, but more importantly than that, as a marketer, I think it's always how you position your brand and how your customers are perceiving that. Now, I could not write this, even as a marketer, I do not write this flowery and AI could not have done this for me. But these are verbatim comments from our current students who, when we survey them, have given us a really healthy net promoter score. And one of the reasons that they do this is because of our commitment to sustainability. So I think my favourite quote is in the middle there about the 18 year old female from Melbourne who learned her dreams of helping the planet and everything else with life might just come true. So you can't make that sort of stuff up, but that is the commitment that our current students have. You might have noticed that I'm a bit of an education nerd, so my PhD is actually an expectation versus experience of our students. And I do want to come on here today and say that it actually counts. What you do, how you position your brand, and the commitments you make in terms of sustainability are very real, tangible outcomes that they're interested in. And so finally there, I just wanted to close on this slide. So our tagline around the number one university in climate action in the world is something that resonates really strongly, not only with our current students, but prospe prospective students as well. So in terms of attracting new audiences, this is really critical for us and partnering with Scope 3 was just another way that we can further embed ourselves uh, and position ourselves to attract more students. Fantastic. Yeah. Question. There are two quickies from Slido, and there's one in real life, as it were. <laughs> real life. Hello. I really resonated with what you shared about data warehouses and the cloud actually sits in a physical box. Um, and I guess my question is, you spoke a lot about the media and sustainability with the media buying, but measurement's actually interesting. When we're measuring, we're running incrementality studies, running MMMs, we're using modelling and data warehouses, it takes data processing. So I'm curious what your approach has been or will be in terms of expanding beyond the media, but how you're sort of measuring the impact of that. Yeah, so um, Scope 3 really kind of started and focused on the digital side. There's a lot more that obviously sort of touches and it is forever growing. So, you know, we look at digital web, app, video, CTV, streaming, social, um, you know, for example, search is not one that we're doing yet, but it's one that's, you know, put in for Q4. Digital at a home is something that we're measuring, but not looking at static. So um, we haven't measured all channels, I guess, in our industry yet, but we're also looking at creative production. So it will come, hopefully. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things that, unfortunately, it's things that we need to be aware of, including things like AI. AI is one that really nobody talks about, but a standard search versus an AI search is 10x a standard search. So, um, yeah, there's a lot that we haven't even touched or scraped the surface on, but it is something that I guess you guys should be aware of, especially with um, what I would, I would call useless data. I, mean, I know you guys might hate me for this, but because, you know, I, I've been in data for a very, very long time for those that know me. But there is a whole bunch of data sets that really are not needed or are 10 years old and really not appropriate for where we are now. So there's a whole bunch that can actually be deleted and not stored forever. Um, and that's probably something that you could potentially look at. Uh, before I come to David, quick one for you, Courtney. The measure of success for those impressive numbers, was, was that applications? Was that actually admissions? 
emissions. So I think the number that I quoted before around the increase in applications was through another initiative. Right. But um, I guess what I was really trying to put forward as a marketing practitioner is working with your agency to take those risks makes yep. it quite easy, makes it quite simple, right? Because you've got the equity there to build on. Uh, we had the success of a previous campaign. So this was just really icing on the cake for us to be able to do that as well as improve applications also in a separate campaign. Thank you. No and where you mention that you're diverting money away from certain media owner or seller partners, is there a proactive reach out to those partners to let them know that they're sitting within that categorization? Is that something Absolutely. that's done for free? Yeah. So, so they know what's happening? Um, it, we actually highlight it. So, I mean, the outsiders, a lot of it aren't real sites or sites that most brands want to sort of be across. But there are sites that are genuine real sites that are high emissions. And I've actually worked with partners to get contacts of these. So. It doesn't fall on you again. It's like, hey, can you highlight it to scope three? Um, but the thing is, I'll say is a lot of um, publishers aren't even aware. Yeah. One of my favorite examples was MSN, as big as they were. Um, Brian's quoted this before, oh. so I don't feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, but over $12 of spend in a quarter, 12 USD, if it makes it better, um, they were able to reduce their emissions on their site by 80% in four months. So they went from a 1,600 gram per thousand impressions down to I think they're about 220 now. It's not, it's not a pitch for MSN, but it's again just showing how quickly they can move if someone highlights it to them. A reminder that some of the, some of the um, work can be done is pretty 101. We put some output from our working group with some, some of which is pretty quick and some of it's a little longer. So you, it's something you can start doing today. Thanks, CJ. Yeah, look, on the publisher side, really curious to see how this doesn't become a publisher tax. Um, and I, where we've got vendors or technology supply partners that basically supplying technology solutions for us, how do we avoid a double dip of tax that the vendor would get being passed on to the publisher in that space? Yeah. yeah I think this is a really good initiative, by the way, too. Like, yeah. Love it. So, I mean, we work with publishers all the time, and part of a publisher coming on board is us helping them show that they're green, if they are green, and use this. Um, some sites are uh, within that, but um, they can actually offer free measurement reporting to brands and clients. So it becomes a service that you can then offer people like University of Tasmania without them sort of paying for it. Or you can potentially chuck in, you know, upfronts are coming up. You can have a conversation and talk about if you're able to supply this level of measurement, what it would mean. Um, the thing is at an individual publisher level, it does make it hard for certain brands because they generally want to see the whole thing. So there are, you know, conversations on both sides. but. The biggest thing is it, it's not a tax because we're driving basically brands to spend on sites that are greener, that are real sites, that are content created sites. That's what Scope 3 is, you know, sort of foundationally about. 